Hey everybody, welcome back to another review, and this time we're talking about The Batman Chronicles Volume 3, which collects Detective Comics numbers 46 through 50, Batman number 4 and 5, and then World's Best Comics number 1, which we won't really talk about, there's not a lot to say there. Uh, so it opens with 46, and this is one I was kind of waiting to get to, because there's a couple of issues here that are pretty important to the character's history. In Batman number four, we finally name the city Batman lives in as Gotham City, and that carries over the mythology all the way through. We also get a really great issue that introduces Fear Toxin, although not through Scarecrow, and it's also the death of Hugo Strange in the very beginning. Um, we also get Batman going off the deep end because of Robin in this, which is something that would fester throughout the comics for a long, long time afterwards. Now... I hesitate to call this my favorite volume of this so far because I still really miss the first appearance costume. I can never let that go that they ditched it so early when it was clearly the best design. But even so, I feel like the stories here are more focused, uh, better written, and have a lot more going on them idea-wise than, uh, than both previous volumes. Um, and, and since it's that way, I might as well go maybe story for story since there's not too much to cover. This is only seven issues as opposed to ten from the second volume and eleven in the first volume. Um, so we start this with Detective Comics number 46, which is uh, Professor Strange's Fear Dust, which is essentially the story where uh, it opens with Batman taking out a group of criminals, and then there's a kid who works with them, and he works for Professor Hugo Strange, who Batman thought died much earlier and Hugo Strange has got this fear toxin that he's using to take over the world, which is immediately a really interesting idea because at this point, Batman isn't a guy that rules through fear. Batman is kind of just a lone vigilante, uh, making a difference in very small ways, and is more about a, a curious Sherlock Holmes character than anything else. And we kind of uh, use the Sherlock Holmes motifs throughout this particular issue because the way Hugo Strange dies at the end is very similar to the final problem. Uh, really close to that art style, actually, and I think that's part of why I like it, that that final confrontation between Hugo Strange and Batman is on a cliff, and it's almost almost intentionally drawn like that final problem cover. Um, it's also one of the best uses of Robin, because he's hardly in the issue, and then he shows up when Batman has to be in more places than once, and that's exactly the kind of function Robin should serve. Uh, Hugo Strange's essentially idea is to use this fear dust that uh, he and whoever he gives a certain pill to are immune to, to kind of take over the country uh, a small portion by small portion and rule it through fear. And uh, Batman is constantly beat up throughout the issue, and he always gets back up, and there's a really great idea here that Batman isn't the embodiment of fear, Batman is the embodiment of courage in the face of fear, and so he's constantly got the crap kicked out of him, and he always gets back up, and at the end, when he is immune to fear, it's more of a statement of Batman's immune to manipulation, that Batman is always Batman. Uh, and it's very similar to kind of what Neil Gaiman would do with whatever happened to the Cape Crusader, that... Um, it's kind of a, if Batman died in this issue, then it'd be okay, because at least he kept getting up to try and stop Hugo Strange. Uh, it's a really classic story. It's a really good example of uh, why Batman's a great character in the first place, and it's just a lot of fun. It's got some of the best uh, Bill Finger dialogue that I've ever read. Uh, the whole thing just reads very quickly, and... It does have that problem a lot of early comics do where the narrations feel unnecessary. Uh, everything is building to a very rational conclusion by the end, and I really do like that about it. It's one of my favorite issues uh, in the early Batman run. Uh, then we get Detective number 47, which is also really good, uh, called Money Can't Buy Happiness, and it's essentially a story about... Um, a rich family that have been hurting their kids because they don't let them experience human flourishing, um, and they're completely caught up in the power of wealth and the importance of money. And um, Batman teaches them a really hard lesson at the end when uh, the, one of the one of their kids a uh, hit and runs uh, a newspaper boy. Uh, and so Batman is bringing them to justice, but he's very adamant about the fact that you have to be the one to turn yourself in. You have to make that choice because it, you made the choice to run him over as well. And it's not entirely your fault because your parents raised you a certain way, but you should still have enough moral aptitude to get past that. 
uh, and I, I really like that. Um, I feel like it would have worked a little bit better by the end if uh, he couldn't have just like made restitutions with his parents' money by the end. I wish he actually, the kid actually landed in jail for his crimes and the parents learned their lesson at the end and we kind of flash forward a year uh, to when the kid got out of jail. Um, but I do overall like the message of it. Um, and then we have Batman number four, which I said is the, uh, the first naming of, um, Gotham City. And, uh, it's another Joker story, and Joker has his crime circus in that one, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, Joker continuing to be a really creepy, really bizarre character, uh, one that's a lot about the theatrics, and he's about the performance art of the thing. Uh, but he's also really manic and, and creepy and bizarre, and he's not this clown prince of crime as much as he's just a master manipulator that wears clown makeup. Um, well, he does, it's not really makeup because his skin is bleached that way, but it, it, it adds like a layer of mystery to it if you wonder how he got that way. And it's, it's a really wonderfully atmospheric story. Uh, then we get number 48, Detective 48, which is The Secret Cavern, uh, which is which is okay. Um, the Secret Cavern is uh, basically like a Batcave kind of origin story. Um and it's not really the Batcave by the end. Uh, it's it's just okay. There's not a lot to say there. There's not a lot of uh, moving of the themes there. Um, but then we come back to some of the, the themes that we started with the Joker when we get to number 49, where we meet Clayface again. And uh, it's again about the the glory of, of the profession and uh, Clayface being completely caught up in his pride and in his need to kind of maintain that glory eternally. And he feels like that legacy is going to die away. Uh, because his his work gets remade and because people move past him. Uh, I, again, it's a really good story. Early Clayface stuff I wish we'd go back to because I like this idea of a person being malleable as opposed to just like a giant clay monster. I feel like the, the idea that Batman has to tangle with a master of disguise is something that we don't use very often. Um, essentially, Batman fighting the Spider-Man villain, the chameleon. Uh, I feel like that's a story that needs to happen. Um... Then we got Detective Comics 50, which is the case of the of the Three Devils, which is uh, kind of fun. I, I When I initially opened it, I almost thought, oh, is this kind of where Morrison got the idea for the Three Devils of Batman, uh, or the Three Ghosts of Batman? And it's not really. It's just kind of a bunch of acrobats in devil costumes, and it's, it's kind of fun. Um, I think the real star of it, though, is when we get to Detective Com or not Detective, when we get to Batman number five, which is the end of this. Uh, and like I said, I'm not really going to talk about World's Best Comics number one, because there's nothing really to talk about. Um, but I think the, the star of this volume is Batman number five, which has got, uh, like the other Batman issues, a number of short stories in it. Um, but the big one is um, The Case of the Honest Crook, which I think is absolutely great. I mentioned earlier that this is where we get like Batman going off the deep end because of Robin. And that's exactly what happened in the story. Basically, the, the, the uh, essence of it is that uh, Batman is... Um, fighting a criminal and Robin gets uh really beat up badly and he thinks Robin's died and uh he he's like really ready to blame himself for it and he, he's completely consumed by the fact oh my god I got a child killed and then he turns out to be um alive and he takes him to one of his doctor friends who kills him up and then Batman goes back and just completely filled with vengeance takes out everyone and the guy who did it, the guy that, that hurt Robin as badly as he did, he, he he shoots Batman in the chest three times, and Batman just keeps walking and beats the crap out of him. He, he's at this moment where, I should kill you, but that's not the right way of doing things. And you just go to the next panel, and he hands him off to the police. And then later you get Batman, who's patched up, and he's like, well, I just pulled three bullets out of your chest. How did you do that? Uh, and I really like this. I like that Batman can just push himself so much, and... Um, that he becomes so much of a protective parent uh, after what happened to Robin. Uh, I thought that was absolutely great. It's it's really becoming one of my favorite Batman stories of all time now that I'm thinking about it, uh, because it's so raw and it's so emotional, especially for that time period. Uh, but it also maintains the same kind of Bill Finger simplicity, where the themes aren't being bought, aren't being uh, smacked over the head, and you aren't like getting moral tales. You're just getting a good character stuff and interesting stories. And in your mind, the ground shakes beneath you when you start to see the ideas, uh, kind of what Matt Wagner does later. Uh, I just, I really like it. It's it's incredibly well done. And um, Bob Kane uh, turns in some really good art there. I think that's the best art he's done since the early issues, actually. Um, but I don't know, you, you kind of have to chalk a lot of that up to... to um, Bill Fringer, probably, since he's the one dictating how these stories look, and uh, Bob Kane is just kind of filling in the blanks for him. Um... 
it's really good though i really enjoyed it um if people were having trouble keeping up with these uh, and and they weren't sure if they wanted to keep going with the batman chronicles after volume two uh because they felt like you just got a little bit too campy then i highly recommend reading volume three uh you don't need to read these things in order it, it sometimes helps because villains come back um but if you aren't the, the fan of old of older comics then i think that this is a really good place to start because this is so much about the origin of Batman's mythology and so much about um, bringing forward these aspects of the character and, and very naturally giving us reasons for them. Uh, and it's not in, in the days now where it's overblown and you see it everywhere, but making some extremely human personal things first, that just kind of infuse and you can just read it. Uh, filtering through the character uh, and getting a sense of that history and where these ideas come from. I just, I love it. It, it was kind of a euphoric experience for me. Uh, I really like it because I love Robin so much as a character. And so reading that final issue and getting uh, Batman and Robin um, working together the way they do and Bruce being so um, lost without him, I really like. And Robin is utilized beautifully throughout these um, a whole set of uh, first few issues uh, where he's only there as Batman's second hand, as uh, Batman needs to be in two places at once, Batman's fighting too many crooks at once, Robin's there as backup, and he doesn't um, diminish the tone of the book at all. Robin is uh, there because he's got the same kind of insecurities and emotional baggage as Bruce Wayne, and uh, he channels it differently, and Bruce thinks he can help him. Uh, and they, they both play off each other really well. They really are a dynamic duo, um, instead of just kind of uh, a necessary formula. It doesn't feel like Robin has lightened up the book at all, and I really love that. Um, there's a moment I forgot to mention in the second volume where uh, Robin helps take a bullet out of uh, out of Bruce's chest, uh, or not chest, but like his arm or something like that. And so you're not making the book any any less dark or any less gritty than it was just because Robin's there, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, but I highly recommend uh, reading this. I think it's absolutely great. The art looks fantastic. There's actually an issue near the middle here where um, I get the feeling that the, the only remaining copy of that issue was really faded because the art, I I the brightness on the art is turned up way too high, and I wonder if that's just because they weren't able to scan it or uh, reprint it the, in the best fashion. Um, and that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure if anyone uh, else experiences that, uh, or maybe it's just my copy, but it looks so different as compared to the rest of the pages, and so I'm not really sure what's up with that. Um, but this is really good, and I can't wait to go through the next volume of this. This has just been a really fun experience. Uh, and we're getting close to the World War I stuff. Um, I don't think there's any dates on these issues as of yet. Oh, no, yes, there are. Um... We, we are in spring of 1941 by the end of this. Uh, so we're getting really close to uh, Batman at War, and I think we might get that with the next volume. Um, so thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments, uh, whether you agree or disagree with anything I said, and I'll see everyone next time with another video.